Today, I'm going to be talking about taking God risks. And I really believe that we are in a season, um, and there's an invitation for us right now to really take some God risks in our life. And I want to just talk about risk for a moment. You know, I think there's kind of two different types of risk takers. And um, one is kind of the calculated, maybe God risk takers. I like to think of myself in that category. Um, you know, things like, well, let me give you an example. I think Hone and I are very different kind of risk takers. Um, I think I'm the right kind of risk taker, <laughs> for sure. Um, and I think he's just kind of the crazy risk taker. Um, if you know, if you've known us for, for very long, you would know this about us, but um, our, our greatest point of contention in our entire marriage has been about our different approach at what is appropriate in parenting. Like, what should our kids be able to do? And we are on very, we're, we're very similar in a lot of ways, but we are on opposite ends of the spectrum with that. Um, so, you know, for example, kind of when I think about risk taking, I think about like, you know, a few years ago, I had this incredible invitation to go into North Korea and do some stuff with some of the underground movement, what's happening there. And to me, that was prayed, no brainer, I'm going, no problem. And everybody's like, you've got kids and whatever. And I was like, Jesus is in it, like I'm good, you know? And that, those kinds of things are no problem for me. Um, you know, moving to Africa at 21 years old by myself, like in a desert with a nomadic tribe, people are like, uh, what? You know, I'm like, no problem, God's in it. Hona, on the other perspective, he, he does take a lot of God risks, but, um, you know, he's a little more of the uncalculated risk taker, I would maybe define it like that. Um, you know, with our kids thinking, you know, things like, Oh gosh, I, I, remember, I remember when Josiah was just maybe nine months old, tiny. And you know, most people when they go to the park, they like throw the ball at each other or whatever. Hona and his friend were standing far away from each other, throwing my nine month old <laughs> to each other. I got him. You got him, cool. Like literally, and I'm like, ah, ah, you know. Um, or <laughs> like, why? <laughs> um, or, you know, one time in Ecuador, I decided to take a nap, God forbid, and I woke up to my five-year-old tiny baby girl, like, on a horse. I mean, her legs, I mean, forget getting in the stirrups. I mean, she is tiny. She's just hanging on for dear life, no corral, and just running full speed on a horse on the backside of, you know, Ecuador. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, hang on. And she's like, ah, you know, flying. Um, things like that. <laughs> we go, you know, Kalila, you're with us. We went zip lining. We go zip lining in Ecuador and um, take our teams. And it's, it's pretty intense. It's high. It's like way up there. You're like zip lining over jungle-ish stuff. Like I don't, you're just like way up. You know, this is not like little American zip lining. This is like foreign country. You really hope that if somebody's checking that there's some kind of like something happening here. And the place we go, you know, it's really clear on the wall. You have to be 10 years old to do the training, to do the zip lining. And here's Hona, you know, like our five-year-old, like Rue is five. I mean, he, Rue at five. I mean, he looked three. He's just chunky little baby, you know. And Hona trying to convince the, the tour guide people that Rue is 10 and can go zip lining. <laughs> and I'm like, there's rules for a reason, you know. No. And they're like, no, it's too dangerous. It's too, you know. There's a lot you got to do. You got to stop brace yourself and the whole thing. And, and Hona is not successful in convincing them that he's 10, but he's like bribing him on the side to let our five-year-old go ziplining. And my five-year-old went ziplining, you know? And I'm just like, this is my life. Um, or if you follow us on Facebook this summer, you saw that my boys learned to drive in Ecuador. Um, they are eight and 10. And <laughs> Malika got sick one day, hence I was staying back. And um, he, you were there. You witnessed this. Okay. So my boys, you know, 8 and 10, driving on a mountain where there's literally a cliff on one side. And they're just driving along. This is, this is pray for me. Pray for me. <sighs> you know, I think most women, you mess with their kids and you're in trouble. But a Latina woman, I mean, you mess with her kids, you better be right with God, okay? You better be right with God. You're going to meet your maker. Um, so anyways, the kind of risks I want to talk about today are more like the kind of risk I would take. Um, God risks. 
risking for the kingdom, that kind of a thing. Um, anyways, we're going we're gonna to start in Mark chapter 2. If you have your Bibles, you can turn with us. I love this story. Mark chapter 2. A few days later, when Jesus entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door, and he preached the word to them. Some men came, bringing to him a paralyzed man carried by four of them. So since they could not get to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it and then lowered the mat the man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, son, your sins are forgiven. Now, some teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, well, how does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts, and he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier, to say to this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and take your mat and walk? But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. He got up, took his mat, and walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, we've never seen anything like this. I love this story. I love, there's so much I love about this story. I'm not going to go into a lot of the details of this story, but I really love what happens here. You know, maybe some of us can, can relate to, like, this paralyzed guy on this mat, right, where maybe we've been in a season feeling like we're just kind of stuck. We're paralyzed. We're unable to move. We're, we're limited, and we just need to get before Jesus in that area of our life or in those dreams or in that whatever. Or maybe we can relate to the friends, and maybe we're the friends in the story who are together carrying a dream, carrying something we're believing for, but it just it needs, it needs legs. It needs to run. It needs, it needs some kind of momentum in it. It's feeling stuck, it feels paralyzed, and, and we're just bringing it together to Jesus, saying, Jesus, we know that you have a heart for this dream. Will you, will you heal it? Will you touch it? Will you empower it? But one thing I think is so crazy about this story is, and I think sometimes when we hear these stories, we forget the reality of what's happening. These guys climb up on somebody's roof and straight drill like a hole. I mean, they start tearing apart somebody's roof, and make a giant hole in somebody's roof. I mean, we're not talking a little peephole. This is a stretcher size hole in somebody's roof to get this man lowered. That's a lot of risk. You come start tearing apart my roof, you're risking. Not that I have much to do, but throw something at you. You know, like, I mean, I don't know. That's a lot of risk. And what I think is so interesting because they're risking in this moment their reputation. Jesus could have been like, seriously? You're tearing apart this poor family's roof, you know? They're risking being mocked by other people. You guys are so over the top, so zealous, so, you know, whatever. Calm down. They're risking all these different things, but they are willing to risk to be in the presence of Jesus. And how many of you know when you risk for the sake of Christ, it always pays off, right? Even if it doesn't turn out how you hoped, it always pays off. God gets glory. God rewards risk. It's beautiful. And, and I love this story. And um, <clears throat> I think this is what, how we need to begin to under, or look and understand that obstacles are merely invitations if you're willing to risk. Obstacles in your life are merely opportunities and invitations if you're actually willing to risk. Risk humiliation, risk failure, risk offending, risk losing. Most of us do everything to maintain, to protect. And actually in the kingdom, we're invited on this wild, wild journey of risking it all, of laying it all down, of passionately going after Christ. Have you ever wondered why it seems like God uses some people more than others? Or why some people have these crazy God stories and some people don't have any? <clears throat> You're like, I think about that all the time. Um, maybe not. Um, I, I want to offer this thought to you, that every single Christian's life is marked by windows of opportunity. 
windows of opportunity that demand that you take a radical step of faith in order to follow Christ and fulfill his call on your life. I wholeheartedly believe that every one of us has these kind of kairos, divine windows and moments of opportunity. That if you risk in those moments, it literally propels your life in a direction. Versus if you don't step through that window and take that risk at that moment, you're not going to end up where you're supposed to end up. Many times we're here and we're trying to get here. And we just want to get here. But if you're, if you're just holding yourself out here until you're there, you're going to miss it. Because many times he's like, I want you here. And then if you aren't here, you're never going to be here. And if you're not there, you're never going to make it here. You know what I'm saying? Many times, and then that leads you here. And the only way to get here is to go through that door. But the only way you're going to have gotten there is you had to obey, obey here. Yeah. And the only way you're going to get there was you had to be faithful here. And I think we forget that, that, that God is this master of inviting us into this wild journey. But you guys, it requires great risk. It requires great faith. And I feel like we are in a very, um, even as we're praying just for, as we've been in this kind of season, Rosh Hashanah, Ram Kippur, this new, on the Jewish calendar, like a new season, I really feel, um, and I'll be sharing more about this next week, but I really, really feel like expression, that this, there's a divine invitation for us in this season to take radical risk. Some people are like, <laughs> I don't want that. I know, I know. But let me tell you, it's going to be so worth it. Um, where there's no risk, there's no faith. That's just the truth. Faith is just talk and theory and whatever until there's risk. Where there's no risk, there's no faith. And where there's no faith, there's no power. And where there's no faith, there's no real connection to God. And where there's no faith, there's no supernatural. In fact, where there's no faith, there's no pleasing God. So faith is necessary for all these things. And yet, if there's no risk, there's no faith. You know, I really believe that, that faith is that womb, if you will, where all of these things are birthed, where dreams are birthed, not just I have a dream in my head, uh, the realization of a dream, seeing it manifested, seeing it come to be, right? Faith is the place at where this is birthed. Faith is the starting point, but risk is the road that takes you to the impossible. Faith is the starting point, but risk is the road you must journey to see the impossible become possible. I mean, I look at some of these heroes on our wall. They all took great risks to shift things in society. They took great risks in their day. Nobody changes the world without taking a risk. Risks are part of it. R risking, going after it, right? It's part of it. We don't change the world just in our comfort zone. You know, Christians should not be the safest, most comfortable, predictable people you know. Just, just go a little deeper there. Let that hit a little more. You should not be the safest, most comfortable, predictable person in your friendship circle. You'd be a safe person. You know what I'm saying. But... <laughs> Don't be a weirdo. Um, I mean, secure, worrying about, we're not like everybody else. We're not meant to build up our fortress and our security and self-protection. And that's not what we're doing here. We belong to a different kingdom. Our, our, our treasures are in heaven. We live for an eternal cause. We are willing to follow where he leads. Christians throughout all of history are the ones who push the envelope. Christians are the one who take great risks. Christians are the one who do radical things to see the kingdom of God go forward. You wouldn't be sitting here today knowing the God you know unless other people hadn't given their life and sacrificed and risked for the advancement of the kingdom. This is the truth. This is, this is the family we're a part of. This is our kingdom. This is, this is our DNA. We are risk takers. 
You know, we did, a, many of you know this because you're here, but did this whole series this summer on, on kingdom culture. And I think this is one of those things that clashes American culture versus kingdom culture. American culture tells us self-protect. Don't do anything too risky. Diversify your investments. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. That's ridiculous. You know, like, we just get comfortable. How do you, you know, bigger walls, bigger duct tape your house. I don't know. Like, we're just, like, baby-proof the world, you know? Like, we're just, we want to just self-protect. And the kingdom is so opposite to that. God's like, lay your life down. You're like, oh, my God, what? Get uncomfortable. Give it all away. Love until it hurts. Do radical things. And we're like, oh, I kind of wanted to be the Christian who, like, could just still be really, like, posh and comfy. I mean, I think that sometimes. <laughs> I'm like, can I just love you and, like, I don't know, be real comfortable? It's human nature. And yet God's like, you were made for more. Come on. You are made for more. Don't buy the lie of this false security. The reality is the security we build for ourselves is so deceptive. It's such a lie. The safest place to be, the most fulfilling place to be is following Christ wherever he's going. Let me tell you, if, you're, if Christ is walking you into a war zone, it is much safer and more secure and fulfilling to be walking into a war zone than be sitting home and watching Netflix. You're going to choke on your popcorn probably at home anyways. You know what I mean? You never know what can happen. There's danger that can happen anywhere. It's true. I took a kid to the hospital who inhaled popcorn in a movie theater. I mean, it can happen. My child. I'm like, can you not laugh while you're eating, stuffing handfuls of popcorn in your mouth? Um, it's, it's, it's a deception, right, that we're secure. These things we build our lives around. It's a deception. And, um, you know, if you kind of think, look through Scripture, there's so many different people who understood this and who understood that risk is scary, right? And, and that risk is the only way, the, the reason they even got in the Bible is because they took a risk. They took a risk. And um, I really think that there's this, I don't know, I just keep feeling it in my spirit. It's like God saying... Come on, guys. I'm about to do something crazy right now. I'm about, we're just literally, it's like this thing of, if will you just take this risk? I'm about to unleash a snowball effect. I feel like there's so many people in this room, this message is for you today. This message is for you. You've been holding this dream. You've been stirring this thing. It's kind of just growing in you. And I feel like God is like, today's the day. I want you to start stepping out, right? Whatever that looks like. Whether that's, you know, quitting the job, Get, taking the job, writing the book, writing the song, you know, going back and focusing on your marriage like you know you need to, dealing with that addiction, like getting your kids around the table and having conversation about re what's really issues that are really going on, whether it's, you know, pitching that deal, starting that blog, whatever it is, whatever it is, I feel this like, will you just risk for the advancement of the kingdom and watch what I do? Okay. So I want to just kind of look for a moment at, at some people um, in the Bible who took great risks and um, what came of it. So most of us, we know, we know the story of Abraham, who was Abram originally until he stepped out in faith and became Abraham. But I think this story is crazy because God speaks to Abraham. So, I mean, we hear the story. We're like, oh, God speaks. Imagine an imaginary, not imaginary, a, a um, what's the word I'm thinking of? Invisible. An invisible God begins to speak to you. Leave your family. Leave your country. He's in his 70s. He's not like 18 and looking to go backpacking around the Middle East. You know what I mean? He's not just like looking for an adventure. Like, leave everything. Okay, God, where am I going? Uh, TBD. Start walking. And he does. This is like pre-Greyhound, pre-Amtrak, pre-Airlines. I mean, he is just like, all right, pack up the donkeys, camels. I don't know. We're going on a walk. Where to? I don't know. Why? 
God said. And you think about this crazy risk that Abram took and what came out of that risk? An entire nation. And what came out of that risk? The bloodline of our Messiah. That's amazing. What's on the other side of your risk? It's not just for you to go, oh my gosh, that was awesome, I saw God. I'm telling you, your generations, your legacy, there is things God is trying to birth through your life that are coming out of the other side of your risk. There is an army of people that are about to walk through because of your risk. Or Moses. Moses is, you know, should not be going back to Egypt. There is like a warrant out for him. It is risky, and he heads right back in, right back in. He chooses to not self-protect. He goes right back in to help lead the people of God into freedom, and he helps deliver a nation out of slavery. Or David, he fights the giants that others refuse to face. You know, I love this story because it's not like David showed up like, oh, I'm going to go slay me a giant. David's just bringing the bologna sandwich. You know, like he's not, I mean, he is like, he just shows up and is like, I'm sorry, what? This guy's insulting my God and none of all y'all are not going to do anything about it? You're just going to sit here? I mean, many of you, this is your story. You're David. You're just going to walk into your neighborhood and be like, I'm sorry, what's happening? This injustice, see, they're praying for you. This injustice, this thing is happening in my day, in my generation, not okay. We're going to do something about it. I didn't know I was going to fight this giant. I didn't sign up to fight this giant. But you know what I mean? I'm going to fight the giant. Because there's a giant in God's way. And it needs to move because the kingdom of God is going to advance. Right? I love this. Esther. She confronts evil in the highest position of authority. You know, you read the story and you think, oh, that's kind of cool. She's pretty. Oh, Esther treatments. Who wants to do a mask? No, no, no. There's nothing cool about this story. There's nothing cool about this story. She's like a sex slave. I mean, she is, this is horrible. This, you know, and it's not like, you know, she was completely... It was easy to get another wife. The queen before her had a bad day and she's gone. You know, I mean, it's like he's got plenty of women to choose from. She is completely risking her life. And, you know, I I want you to think about this. Esther does not get a prophetic word. Esther does not have an angel show up in her room. Esther does not get a confirmation from the Lord. It's going to be okay. I I got you. He's not going to kill you. She doesn't have any of that. She doesn't have... 47 prophetic words about what she's supposed to do. Some of us are waiting for that. We're waiting for the light to show up in the room and tell us what to do. We're waiting to be called out 29 times. We're waiting for a strategy from God and all these things before we're willing to do anything for the kingdom of God. She doesn't have any of that. She just says, if I don't risk, lives will be lost. I'm the one. I will risk my life for the saving of others. She doesn't need the prophetic word. She doesn't get any of that. She just steps in. And we know she doesn't know the outcome because she says, if I perish, I perish. She was fully like, guys, it's a coin toss. I could die, but I'm willing to do this to advance the kingdom. You see, it's not a risk if you know it's going to turn out okay. That's not a risk. A real risk is I actually have no idea how this is going to turn out. It's going to be awesome. I might totally fall on my face. I might be homeless or whatever. You know, like I might be whatever. Like when you're risking, you're kind of like a real risk is actual risk. Not like God spoke 39 words. It's going to be great. Like that's nice, but that's not risk, right? That's just obedience at that point. Um. So she took a huge risk. Then there's Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You remember those guys from Sunday school? No? You didn't go to church when you were a kid? Okay. Um, not a church kid. Um, so, you know, these guys, and, and King Nebuchadnezzar builds this big idol statue and is like, everybody bow down to it. And they have to make a decision. What are they going to do? And the temptation, which is the, still the temptation in Babylon, is 
modern Babylon. You're like, what? Babylon? And, and the, kind of that spirit of Babylon is the spirit of the world is, oh, I have to bow down to mixture to make it. I have to fit in. I have to talk like everybody. I have to be like everybody else. I have to compromise just a little or else nobody's going to accept me. The only way to get promoted here, the only way to, to have favor in the entertainment industry is I just have to compromise just a little bit, just a little bit of mixture. That's the temptation there, right? The temptation in Babylon. And, and they make the choice in their heart and they say, we're not going to have mixture. We're not going to worship our God and the God of the world. We're not going to do this. We're only going to, we're going to be true and pure before our God. And they refuse to bow to this thing, knowing that it will cost them greatly. Not just their reputation, their lives. And they make this decision, right? And they, they begin to tell King Nebuchadnezzar in um, Daniel 3, verses 16 to 18. They say, oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace. And he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not... Be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. They're about to be thrown into a furnace. And they say, we think God's going to deliver us. But in case he doesn't, final words, just want you to know, it's worth it. We're not going to bow down to you. You know, we're going to serve God. Even if. Even if this horrible thing happens, he's still worthy of our love and our service. My love and my service to God isn't based off of him, you know, just making my life rosy. I understand that sometimes things don't go as I planned, but you know what? It's not my will. It's his be done. And they, they face it like this. They have no idea if they're going to come out of this thing or not. And they go into the furnace, and there's the fourth man in the furnace with them, right? We know this story. And I guarantee you, they were probably real nervous walking into, walking into that furnace. Real nervous. I'm sure Esther was real nervous. I'm sure she wasn't like, oh, my gosh, what time is my pedicure? No, she was like, I might die, but I'm doing it anyways, right? Pushing past. I love that. And, you know, I love this story because right after these guys, you know, don't get burned up, and they come out. What happens is King Nebuchadnezzar immediately after this promotes them. And isn't that the temptation to the only way to get, promote, get promoted in the world is you have to just kind of compromise a little bit. And when they make their stand in purity, they actually get way more promoted by doing it God's way. And in fact, King Nebuchadnezzar tells all the people, you, you guys need to serve their God. Their God's the real deal. That's, that's amazing. There's so many people in scripture. Peter. Remember the story where Peter's, you know, fishing and, and Jesus comes along and is like, hey, drop your nets and follow me. And we're like, oh, that's a cool story. No, no, no. That's like his entire livelihood. That's the entire family business. I mean, can you imagine Peter going home and being like, hey, dad, you remember that like business you spent your whole life developing for me and us? And remember how you kind of were hoping I would take care of you when you were old and... <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm going to just not do that anymore. I'm going to go follow that crazy, itinerant Jesus guy. Or his wife. Hey, honey, I just quit my job today. Why? Um, some, some kind of hippie-looking guy. I mean, he was like a hippie in my children's Bible. Some hippie-looking guy, like, came up and was like, follow me. I'm going to go follow him. I mean, can you, this is real risk. Sacrificing, right? Risking on this level to follow Jesus. Paul, I think Paul is probably the greatest New Testament risk taker for the gospel. The gospel advances time and time again because of Paul's massive risk taking. But what I think is so, so crazy about Paul is I love that he says this in, in Acts 20. He says, uh, Acts 20, verse 24, he says, However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. His aim, he didn't consider his life when he's making his decisions. What? Most of us can't even not consider our time or our comfort for like an hour if we're going to do something. I'm like, is it going to be hot? Then no, no, I'm not going. Right? Oh, it doesn't have good parking? No, not worth my time. 
We can't even be remotely inconvenienced. And I want to challenge you to push past kind of your human nature and dig into your spirit man and dig into who God has created you to be, to begin to take, I mean, I just love, Paul. I love that the kingdom of God was so advanced in one man's life because he took risk after risk, escaping buildings and baskets. I mean, crazy risks, crazy risks to the point where he's, he's beaten. He's, you know, I mean, goes through every gamut of horrible thing you can imagine. And, um, you know, thrown in jail, all these things, and executed. And he goes through all of this, and, and sometimes those risks, every time he risked, the kingdom of God moved forward. Sometimes those risks, he personally didn't have to endure a lot of pain, and many times in those risks, he endured a lot of pain. And the kingdom of God went forward. So, you know, on and on, there's all these different people in, in Scripture who inspire me and provoke me. Um, but I want to say this. I really believe, you guys, we are in a divine season to jump. Some of you are like, I don't like this message. <laughs> Listen, there is victory and reward and life and breakthrough on the other side of your risk. There is the advancement of the kingdom on the other side of your risk. I have witnessed this in my, my own life. When I have taken my greatest risks, I have also experienced the greatest glory I've ever experienced. I've, that's where my craziest stories have come, always out of crazy risk. When everybody is like, what are you doing? And I'm like, what am I doing? Oh my God, what am I doing? You know, and boom, God shows up. I'm telling you, we are in this invitation where God's like, guys, guys, it's like, it's like the veil, I don't know, I just keep sensing, it's like the veil between heaven and earth is so thin, and it's just this like, who will just push through? Who will just push through? And I feel like this is the season we're in. Let us not be Christians who don't experience the wildness of God because we're afraid to take risks. Um, faith involves risk, and, you know, obviously risk is very different for, for everybody. What feels risky to me not, might, might not feel risky to you. But I want to say just briefly here four things you need to know about risk-taking, okay? Number one, fear is only a feeling. It's not your boss. Fear is just a feeling. It is not your boss. We're having this conversation with our boys right now. Your emotions are not your boss, right? Just because you feel angry doesn't mean you need to sock your brother. Like, your emotions are not your boss. They're just feelings. You're not your emotions, right? They're just a feeling. And so um, I'm sure all these people we talked about had moments of real fear, real consideration, real nervousness of, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, like, it's human nature, but the difference between feeling that emotion and then allowing that, or allowing that emotion to determine your choices, your actions, is different. It's one thing to feel fear, it's another thing to let it limit you. It's another thing to let it change your behavior, right? Having this conversation with one of my kids about how um, things we're, we were afraid of, and I was saying, I'm I have this fear of heights, and I don't know why, because I've been in lots of high things. I have to force myself to, like, you know, walk up somewhere really, really high or look over an edge, because if not, I will never do it, because it just, like, it, it makes me want to control, like, just never, ever do it, and I don't ever want to be controlled by a fear, and so I think we need to remind ourselves that when we're feeling fear, it's just a feeling. It's not my boss, Right? Do you know that the number, or do you know what the number one most repeated command in the whole Bible is? Fear not. Fear not. The most, uh, most, somebody help me. Repeated, oh dear God. <laughs> My words are not working. The most repeated command in the Bible is fear not, fear not, fear not, fear not. Why? He knows it's human nature to be afraid. At the same time, 
Faith is knowing who our God is and not being stuck in that, knowing that he's good, knowing that he's faithful, knowing that he's a father who's got you, who's not going to lead you somewhere you can't go. He is so faithful and so good. And when we trust his character, it pushes us past fear. The enemy is the king, the king of trying to infuse God's people with fear. Why? Because if the ones who have power over him don't believe it and they're paralyzed in fear... They can't, they're, they're, you know, powerless to him. They don't do anything to destroy his kingdom. He understands that if you and I break out of fear and take risks, we destroy the kingdom of darkness. He can't stop you. He can't take your authority away, but he can try to lie to you and get you to be afraid so you stop yourself. So the lie gets so big in your head that you become paralyzed, which we come back to the first story. I believe God's healing paralyzation in us because it's time to run and it's time to take risks and it's time to move and it's time to stop allowing fear to be our boss in our life. Amen? Number two, faith requires action. Faith is not a feeling. It's a choice. Many of us wait for this like, oh, feel so full of faith. I'm going to go do something. No, faith is a choice. It's not a feeling. You don't wait till you have Holy Spirit goosebumps to go- decide to go step out and do something. No, it is a choice. I am choosing by faith to take God at his word in my life. I choose by faith to take hold of this peace that he has for me. I choose by faith to believe that I am loved and forgiven. I don't need to have an an emotional experience. Those are beautiful. But I don't need to have an emotional experience to believe God is who he says he is. Faith is a choice, not a feeling, right? Once again, our feelings are very deceptive, as we learned with fear. (laughs) Feelings are just feelings. Faith is a choice, and faith requires action. James 2.14, what good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. I love this. Faith and works go hand in hand. It's not yet to be like, oh, I have faith, I have faith. I believe God, we, you know, can move the mountains. We sang about it today. I believe God can. Here's my perspective. You don't actually believe until you're living it out. Until you're actually living like you believe. Just saying you believe. I believe God's good. And then you go home and you're stressed out feeling like God hates you. Just saying it doesn't make it real in your life. Faith without works is dead. So if you believe that, then you're like, okay, I know God loves me. There's there's fruit to that. There's fruit to that belief system. There's fruit to that faith, right? There is, actions are merely fruit to our faith, evidence of our faith. It's, it's, they go hand in hand. And I want to say this. I feel like many times people live their faith with a red light, They live with a red light mentality where it's kind of like, man, we're not just parked. We got, you know, we have fully moved into the parked position. We've got the e-brake on in our life, and we are just at a red light. And before we're going to do anything, I'm going to need 27 prophetic words. I'm going to need angels to show up. I'm going to need, you know, all these, the stars to align, baby Jesus himself appearing in my living room and speaking to me before I'm willing and you know, can really trust that God's calling me to do anything with my life. Oh, I don't know if I should go on that missions trip. I mean, I've only gotten two confirmations. I probably should, you know, get a few more. We live with this red light mentality. And I I wholeheartedly believe that when Jesus said, go into all the world, that flipped the light green forever for us. The light is green, and it's just go. It's go. It's go. Take those risks. Take those, you know, steps. Go. And trust me, our God is so good. If you're, if you, you know, if you're not supposed to be going, he's going to throw up a yellow light and tell you, hold on, slow down a little bit. 
Or if you're going the wrong direction, trust me, he does this all the time. I'm like, okay, red flags, red light, got it. We're done. We're not doing that, you know. But live in go mode. Live with a green light. I'm telling you, it will so free you up in your life. Like, okay, God, we're doing this. What do you want to do? Let's go for this. I'm going to just keep moving until God tells me no. Versus I'm going to sit here until God tells me to do something. His word already said go, right? So live with that kind of mentality. It's, it's a different way to do it, but that's part of the faith having action. Um, and I want to say this too. Many times we want God just to tell us what to do, and instead I think he's waiting to see how our faith provokes us to action. You know, I think we want just kind of this like, I don't know, this relation. Well, I'll give you an example. When Hon and I were dating, this is kind of a weird example, but when, when we were dating, I wanted God to command me to marry him. I did. <laughs> I did. Um, I did not trust my own judgment in the area of men. I mean, I came from a broken family. I was just like, I just, God, you have to just, signs in the sky, you know, something, command me to marry him and I'll do it. God's like, I don't work like that. I mean, maybe he does for some people. He did, it was not for me. He was like, that's not how I work. And he's like, love is a choice. Do you want to make the, I, as a father, I say this is a great choice. But I don't want you to come back shaking your finger at me one day when he's annoying to you or whatever. You know, like, this is your choice. Do you want to choose to love this man for the rest of your life? And it was like, oh, and I begin to understand God's not looking for robots or for just slaves or for people. You know, he's, he so wants to work with you and move with you and know what's in your heart. And I think so many times we're just waiting for God to give us some, like, I don't know, command us to do something. And he's like, I want to see what my presence and my nature inside of you provokes in you. What do you want to do? What does me in you expressed look like? And I think we, we, you know, we're so fearful of like, you know, doing anything that we many times limit that. And I think God's just like, I have put those dreams in you for a reason. I have given you that personality and that passion for a reason. And he's just putting his nature in us. And it's like, he just wants to see what comes out of us. What do you get passionate? What giant do you want to take down? Like, he loves that. And there will be season in, seasons in your life where he's like, you know, go this way, do this. But there's also seasons in your life where he's like, what giant do you want to take? You know? And it's like, what's your heart burning for? And then you go with that. And that was actually our situation where I was like, eh, you know, just back and forth with this. He wouldn't command me to marry Hona. And, um, and so finally I was like, fine, I choose him. I, you know, and I was just like, it has to be my choice, you know. So I was like, I don't want to live my life without him. And, um, and God was like, perfect. Because all I wanted God to say was, that's my highest for you. That's my highest for you. That's my highest for you. And God was like, I want you to, you know, choose him, whatever. And so I was like, I choose him. And right when I said it, he goes, good, because that's my highest for you. I'm like, why couldn't you have said that, you know? <laughs> but I think, I think many times he wants us to, to be, have part ownership in this thing. You know, he wants to see what makes your heart come alive. He wants us to be a partnership with him. And so many times he's looking to see what, what are you going to get up and do? What are you, what's, in your, what's in your heart, right? I love that. All right. Number three. This one's a little bit of a hard one to swallow, but it's real. God does not promise short-term success. Um. There is no promise that every effort for the cause of God is going to succeed, at least not in the short run. John the Baptist took, you know, took a risk, lost his head. That's just the truth. The early church, in taking risks, some of you are like, well, that was a fun message until that point. Um, <laughs> the early church, in taking risks for the advancement of the kingdom, mo most of them were martyred. So it's not that everything's just going to be rosy and, like, awesome. There's, that's why it's a risk. That's why it's a risk. It's still worthy. It's still something we pursue, right? Our job is to obey. Our job is to step out. Our job is to move in faith and love, and we let him deal with the results. The rest is in God's hands. Success is not, oh, that risk paid off, you know, or it didn't. Success is, I stepped out in the pursuit of the kingdom of God. I stepped out in faith. I stepped out in love. I can't control the results. I can only control me and what's happening inside of me. 
And we need to get comfortable with the fact that, that in taking risks, there are going to be times where there's a cost. Are we okay with that? It's real quiet in here. It's a good question. Are we okay with that? Because I think sometimes we're like, oh, I just really want to just have revival and be rich at the same time and have everybody love me and have everything be awesome. I know. I do. But then you read your Bible and you're like, huh. I don't know. I'm just saying that I think there's this this place in us that has to become mature, like mature love. That's just willing to follow him no matter the cost. That's willing to advance the kingdom no matter the cost. That knows that, that as we're, you know, pushing forward to see heaven come to earth, no matter what it costs us personally, God gets the glory. And it's always worth it. Number four, God rewards faith. Hebrews eleven six 6 in the Passion Translation says, and without faith living within us, it would be impossible to please God. For we come to God in faith, knowing that he is real, and that he rewards the faith of those who give all their passion and strength unto seeing him. I love this. God rewards the faith of those who are pursuing him. God is a rewarder of faith. I've seen this in my life over and over and over and over and over again. Sometimes I even see God rewarding faith of, like, weird people. It's true. Have you ever seen that? No? <laughs> or you're like, dude, why are you using that person so much, God? They're weird. They're like, they're not, like, they're a mess. And he's like, they have faith, and I reward faith. They're a messy package. I'm a God who honors faith. Help me, Jesus, you know. Um, God, God rewards faith. And I feel like he's this kind of like the dad in the swimming pool, you know, and the little, the little kid on the, on the edge of the pool and their little, you know, floaties like afraid to jump in. And daddy's like, come on, baby. This is going to be so fun. You're going to love it. You're gonna, there's a whole world in here waiting for you. I know it's scary. I know you've never done this before. I know you think you're going to drown and die. But promise you, just jump in. I got you. I'm right here. It's gonna, you're gonna, this is going to be your new favorite thing. And they're crying, you know, and the siblings threatening to push him in. It's like a whole moment, you know, and they're just freaking out. And, and dad's like, come on, you, this is going to be so great. Not because he's going to, like, shove him under the water and be like, yeah. Like, it's not the heart of our father. <laughs> That's not the heart of our father. He wants you to experience this new level of grace, of reward, of breakthrough, of fruit that's waiting on the other side of your risk, of your jump. I'm telling you, as you in this season begin to step out, begin to do some crazy things, begin to put yourself out there, begin to, to take that leap, to take that thing, you know, that step that you thought felt impossible. As you begin to do that, you're going to begin to experience a world that you never even thought possible. And you're going to be like, I want to do this again and again and again. And you're going to come alive. I think so much of the church is walking around just kind of out of it and depressed and anxious and whatever. Because we have, we have succumbed to American culture Christianity in a lot of ways. And we have lot, we're not experiencing the fruit of kingdom culture Christianity. You see, we were called to live in the kingdom way. And as we do it the kingdom way, as we follow Christ and his way, there is real kingdom fruit that looks like joy and peace, right? Joy and peace and, and all those things that come at the same time with risk. It's just the kingdom way. As we're stepping out in faith, as we're taking these risks, I'm telling you, there is reward on the other side of your risk. I have experienced this in my life time and time again where I have freaked out, I have panicked, I feel like God's called me somewhere, it just cost me everything, I'm going to have to do this thing, we've moved across the country a gajillion times, we've just done, we've done some crazy things, and I'm just like, God, every time, every time I start to freak out, 
You'd think I'd learn. But I know, I know that I know that I know that I know it's going to be worth it. But it's so scary in that moment. So scary. And then you do it and you're like, oh my gosh, why didn't I do this sooner? Like, this is so much better. My life is so much better. His way is so much better. It's just so life-giving. And you're like, okay. And then you get a little stronger next time. Like, I, we, okay, I know that's crazy. That looks real crazy. But you know what? I know that he's good and I know that he's faithful. And I know that he's going to work this out however it's supposed to work out. And you just, we do these things. I want to tell you, we are made to run. And it's time. It is time. I feel like we've just, there's been a lot of words about this, um, this season that we're in. And it's like, you know, according to the Jewish calendar and 5779, this whole thing. Anyways, birthing, and it's a season of things being manifested. And I really believe that there are dreams and things that have been just kind of growing for a season in you. And it's like, it's time for that now to have flesh and bones. It's now time for that to be manifested. And it's going to come at risk. It's not just going to be birthed in the comfort of your little, you know, comfort bubble. It's going to be in the risk that, boom, it's going to come forth because it's right there. You know, I think about Caleb and Joshua. I love this story and um, in Numbers 13 where, um, you know, the, the Moses sends in, in um, people to spy out the land and to give a report. And Moses and, and Caleb, or I'm um, sorry, Caleb and Joshua go in with 10 other men. And, and the other 10 guys come back and they're just talking about how hard it is, how horrible it is. Actually, the, the, the report is actually kind of funny. Um, they're talking about, they're freaking out about the Nephilim. You know, we saw the Nephilim there. I'm like, sounds like some Christians today freaking out. Okay. Um, you know, we seem like grasshoppers in their eyes. We can't do it. It's too crazy. It's too dark. It's too, you know, gosh, government is crazy, you know, or education or the arts or the, indus the entertainment industry or whatever. Science, whatever. Nephilim everywhere, you know, and, and. There's <laughs> 10 voices saying that amongst the people of God. And then there's the two voices that are like just carrying the big old fat grapes. And they're like, we got it, guys. We got it. We got it. We're cool. Oh, no. We're going in. It's going to be awesome. God's given us the land. We got this. God's with us. All that stuff. No, don't even worry about it. The, where we're headed is awesome. And I just feel expression that this is who we are. I feel like we are meant to be a voice that inspires and encourages the rest of the body of Christ, saying, guys, we got this. We got this. God is faithful. God is good. Taste these grapes. It, God is good. And let me tell you, your victory will free other people. Your faith will provoke courage in other people. Remember when David takes the giant and all of a sudden, all the, you know, the army of Israel who was like, eh, freaking out, suddenly they're like, Rah! and they just go forward. He inspires courage in all the, those that are afraid behind him. You are going to inspire courage in many who are coming behind you. There are many people on the sidelines looking, saying, is there anybody crazy enough to believe that God is real? Is there anybody crazy enough to do it? I think sometimes people have these, this mentality that there's two types of Christians, the crazy ones and the normal ones. And I want to break that down and say, you guys, if you're a Christian, you're just going to be crazy. That's just, that's just part of the package. Not like weird, annoying to be crazy for the sake of crazy. I mean, fruitful, risk-taking, radical, Holy Spirit-filled, partnered with heaven, shaking things, pulling heaven to earth crazy. That is who we are. That is who we are. And it's going to inspire and provoke others around us to have courage. Joshua 1, 9, have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified, do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. I want to end with this. You know, I, I really believe that we are in, we're in this beautiful opportunity right now. You are, you in this room, you're in an, a divine opportunity and I want you to chew on this over this next week and think about it and talk about it. What are the areas where God is asking me to take risk in this season? Where am I trying to play it safe? And where is God asking me to step out? And I want you just to jump in. I want to encourage you. He is with you. 
He is with you. He is faithful and he is good. And most of all, he is worthy. He is worthy. I feel like we're just going to begin to watch dreams realized in this season like never before. I mean, I, I, I'm, we're already seeing it. But it's like there's just a snowball effect that's coming that as you step out and as you take risks in this season, you're going to just be, it's like going to become unstoppable. And my breakthrough is going to lend to your breakthrough and your breakthrough is going to lend to my breakthrough. And it's just going to snowball together. And all of a sudden, it's like, oh my gosh, the kingdom of God is advancing. This is who we are as God's people. We are risk takers. We are risk takers. And so I want to encourage you to shake off anything that is just trying to make you complacent or fearful or just stay sitting down and quiet and not taking that risk. And I want to just encourage you that you are in a divine Cairo season to step through. Divine season of, of, um, of risk. And as we do that, we're going to just see um, just insane fruit. And so I'm, I'm very, very excited. Will you stand with me as we close? Jesus, I pray, I pray for us, Lord. I pray, God, that you would infuse us with courage today. I thank you, God, that we are called to be risk takers, Lord. I thank you, Father, that it's literally in our DNA, that you are with us, God, that it's, it's um, by your spirit that we do these things. Lord, we just come before you and we break our agreements with fear. Father, we just say we're not going to allow fear to continue to dictate our choices. And we're not going to allow fear to give us the narrative for our circumstances. But God, we choose your perspective, we choose your heart, and we choose your voice. And so, Father, I, I thank you that you're calling this house to some radical risk-taking in, in this season, God, for your kingdom. I thank you that there's people all over this room right now that already know, that are already feeling like you're inviting them to step out in some areas. God, I pray that you would stir that in us. I pray, Father, that we would not hold back, that we wouldn't miss this opportunity, this, this divine window of time where you're calling your people to jump. Father, I ask that you would surround us that you would fill us with your courage and that you would give us the wisdom to walk this out. Jesus, we love you, we bless you, and we speak your blessings over every family represented here, God, every person, Lord, that you would just fill us with your spirit this week, that we would move with you, hear you, walk with you, God, commune with you all week. We love you, Jesus, and we bless you. In Jesus' name, amen.